Welcome, my name is Robert Alvarez and I'm on the communications team at the Institute for Policy Studies. Uh, we are here to discuss a new report uh, written by John Pfeffer, who's on the call with us today. Uh, a few other folks will be joining us as well. Um, we, our panelists are Andreas Gunther from Rosa Luxemburg Foundation, Heidi Bayrich from Global Project Against Hate and Extremism, Marta Pardavi from the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, Walden Bello, who was affiliated with the University of the Philippines Diliman, uh, John Pfeffer, um, who, as I mentioned, is the author of the report from the Institute for Policy Studies and Foreign Policy in Focus. And uh, I want to give some logistics for folks participating who, who might uh, come up with questions during the call. So um, if you're joining us through a desktop or the app, you will be able to uh, send questions through a chat box that's at the bottom of your screen. Um, you can send those privately or you can to me as the host or you can send them to the group. Um, and if you are on a telephone, uh, we will have a question and answer session after brief uh, introductions and talking points from the presenters. And at that time, we will um, ask folks uh, who are on to uh, send any questions our way. So um, I'm going to introduce Andres, who will um, give, um, will get things started for us. And Andres, do you wanna, are you ready to take over? Yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, it, this was um, enormous pride that we present this report today that was supported by the New York office of Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung as a progressive think tank with a worldwide uh, global network. We see supporting progressive forces in the struggle against far-right ideology as one of our main tasks. And uh, when John Pfeffer and the RBS proposed this project um, to us last year, it was uh, an easy decision to support it. We live in a pivotal mo moment. We are witnessing the rise of a worldwide new and more extreme right wing. And even more concerning, we see a certain readiness of the political center to accept their extreme right wing positions and uh, that as a uh, legitimate political expression. Luckily, at the same time, there's growing support for progressive politics uh, in a lot of places. But uh, while the right is coordinating their political agenda, the left and progressive forces often fail to coordinate successfully. So the research in this report analyzed, analyzed the situation, found the shortcomings within the progressive forces and identified possible strategies for a progressive response to the new right. Uh, John Pfeffer's thorough and diligent research is the reason for the successful report we present today. John conducted interviews with about 80 international experts. Uh, we invited three of them today to be part of the panel, and I would like to hand over the floor now to them. Um, thank you, Andreas. Uh, my name is Heidi Byrick. I'm the co-founder of a new organization, the Global Project Against Hate and Extremism. I'd like to thank the Rosa Luxemburg in, you know, Foundation, the Institute for Policy Studies, and especially John Pfeffer for having you know, created this opportunity and bringing us all together and this wonderful um, report about how to respond to the growing challenges of an invigorated radical right. Uh, the new project that I'm working out, working on has grown out of a realization that racist and bigoted movements and far-right populist politics are not confined by borders, nor do these organizations see themselves as entirely domestic. And therefore, they require a challenge, as John has laid out in his report, by those of us in progressive movements um, to find an alternative agenda to replace them. At this point in time, we are seeing calls across the Western world about white genocide. This has led to white supremacist inspired terrorist attacks in many countries, concerted efforts to build coordination between far right populist movements, many of whom are driven by xenophobic, anti-immigrant and anti-LGBT ideas, 
and they're working across borders. And so our response to these movements also needs to be transnational and be framed as a way to counter these ideas. And given the need for coordination here, I'm very thankful that we're discussing just that issue. Uh, so today in the United States, uh, where I'm located and where this new project is located, we have a president who has successfully changed the Republican Party into his own image and invigorated a base using racist and anti-immigrant language and putting in place policies such as a Muslim ban, punishing treatment of immigrants and policies attacking the LGBT community, such as uh, the ban on trans troops in the military, that, that poses a serious challenge for those of us who care about multicultural democracy. The US has on its right, a party that is becoming more and more extreme. And as we come closer to the 2020 elections, the rhetoric coming from this party is more extreme. And there's sort of apocalyptic fierceness that exists on the right. They're well aware that changing demographics in the US challenged their control, their vision of control of politics here, and they'll fiercely defend it. Um, at the same time, we see white supremacy on the rise, both in the United States and in other countries. And these people are ready to use violence to maintain their demographic status. The hate movement in the US is growing, it's international, and it's connected to uh, actors in other countries. And the Democratic Party is struggling to rise to this challenge. The, the situation in Iowa last night didn't help. Trump is um, celebrating what happened there. And if Trump wins in November, I think that American democracy faces a serious existential threat that needs to be countered by us. In some ways, we're seeing these same dynamics in other places. In the UK, the forces on the right have had a significant win, both in the elections, which brought Johnson to power with uh, more support than he previously had, and of course, with Brexit. Uh, the path forward with Brexit, Brexit will be difficult um, as reality begins to hurt economically and the UK becomes more isolated. But for now, the far right there is ascendant and celebrating and building alliances with uh, people like Trump and other leaders who share the nativist vision that, that um, drove this. So the question for us here is, will the November 2020 elections and this next year be a step back for the far right? Could Trump possibly uh, lose that election? Or is this going to be a growth year on the far right with Brexit, Trump being reelected, and other electoral victories? Well, the unfortunate situation is that we know that over the past decade, political parties on the far right have moved from the fringes of politics towards the center. Parties that would have been considered extremist have come to power in places like Austria and their vote share is growing. European politics are being upended as the far right moves closer to the center and traditional parties decide to either work with them in governments or take up positions uh, on issues like immigration that um, are much more hard line. And I'd just like to quote, quote loosely from a New York Times story today uh, that was about Austria. It said, the story of Austria's treatment of Jörg Haider's party is the story of the wider European project. Once the far right was anathema, just 20 years ago, Haider's party was denounced uniformly by the EU. Now it is routine. It was born outside of the mainstream. Hyder's party, now with new leadership, is a powerful political force, pushes public debate and government policies. And the same sort of trend has happened in the United States, but within the Republican Party, which at one point in time would never have tolerated the kind of extremism that Trump exhibits, uh, used to throw people out of the party who were openly racist, and now no longer functions in that matter. And these parties also have a long-term strategy. They're trying to become further entrenched in democratic institutions at, on the national level, but also at the international level, like in the EU and at the UN. And they're joined by new upstarts, groups like the Alternative for Germany arising in other countries that share their vision. And these alliances are more than just European and American. They're forged between folks like Bolsonaro in Brazil or Duterte in the Philippines. And of course, there's Putin's rising affection among far-right parties. So all of this means that the issues that John uh, collected in his report are needed to present a political alter alternative to this dynamic that protects marginalized communities, deals with issues that are true threats like climate change as opposed to immigrants and refugees. 
and the organization um, that I've co-founded hopes to help in this effort by documenting the extent of extremism in the U.S. and abroad and to provide factual information on the far-right challenge that we can then use as we organize to counter this threat. Uh, and um, my colleagues on this call have other important ideas, so now I will hand it over, and thank you. I guess I'm next. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Walden Bello, and I'm uh, formerly with the University of the Philippines, but I now teach at the State University of New York. I'm in Manila at this point, and uh, I would first of all like to congratulate John for uh, a really important uh, report and all the groups that participated in it, including um, Focus on the Global South, which is based in Bangkok, uh, of which I am uh, the chair of the board. Uh, I just wanted to say here that um, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is really amazing to people is, you know, how um, this uh, groups that were just marginal as late as about uh, eight years ago, uh, many of them now are in the center of power. That uh, you know that this is a phenomenon that was in many ways not expected uh, by uh, people across the political spectrum. The second thing I would like to say is that this is not just a phenomenon in the global north; uh, it is also a phenomenon in the global south, and uh, we have. Um, uh, in the Philippines, for instance, uh, it's been um, over three years since President Duterte uh, was elected, and the uh, uh, situation is looking very grim. Uh, we have had about 27,000 people who have been subjected to extrajudicial execution um, because they were reportedly um, uh, drug users and that they were supposed to have resisted the rest, but it's very clear you know, that um, in most of these people uh, were uh, uh, deliberately uh, killed by um, police or vigilante groups linked to the police. Um, the, the Philippines, as I said, uh, with 27,000 uh, uh, deaths from extrajudicial execution, this would mean that we now are in third place uh, in terms of um, uh, massive killings in Southeast Asia. Uh, if we remember, uh, the, uh, during the time of the Khmer Rouge in, in Cambodia, you had something like around 3 million people that were killed. Uh, and then in 1965 and 1966 uh, in Indonesia, uh, something like around a million to 2 million people that were killed. And now the Philippines is in third place and we do not see uh, an end to that killing so long as Duterte is in power. In terms of um, uh, another country that used to be a paragon or seen as a paragon of democracy, that is uh, India. Uh, we have uh, the BJP, the Hindu nationalist group that uh, is uh, in power at this point and is in the process uh, of um, legalizing uh, the what one Indian uh, intellectual has called the inferiorization of Muslims, the systematic discrimination against uh, uh, Muslims and the imposition of um, hegemonic Hindu nationalist uh, uh, government that um, uh, has been responsible over the last few years for lynchings uh, of uh, Muslim people uh, of uh, people called untouchables and of tribal people. Uh, so this, you know, uh, is a government that uh, is uh, uh, extremely um, dangerous uh, in terms of the values of secularism, of democracy, and diversity that used to characterize um, and which India was known for as one of the leading uh, democracies in the world. The only other thing I would like to emphasize at this point in time uh, is that um, there is this dialectic between authoritarianism and democracy that we see functioning in the case of um, India and the Philippines. Uh, you know, these governments are democratically elected governments. 
uh, and they won elections by a great margin. Uh, so they're very popular. And uh, we have to try to understand that, uh, you know, that where they get their legitimacy from is from uh, democratic uh, uh, processes. Uh, and uh, why this has happened, I think, um, uh, in, uh, there's been this backlash among people against globalization that has you know, created tremendous crisis and anxiety for large numbers of people throughout the world and um, making them very vulnerable to the kind of right-wing populist anti-immigrant uh, racist appeals of the right. And also um, in the case of India and the Philippines, for instance, we had liberal democracies that you know, uh, promised, you know, equality and empowerment, but did not deliver. In fact, you've had tremendous rise in inequality and poverty uh, in, 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 in these countries. And um, the last point I would just like to say is that um, we have Duterte and um, Modi in India. These are very charismatic individuals. And so I think we must factor this in in order to try to understand the right, to understand the emergence of these people, to understand their appeal, that there is a certain charismatic populist appeal, you know, that, that, um, that somehow uh, makes many people surrender their critical faculties uh, to them. Uh, and so uh, with that, let me just say that we really need to analyze this um, movements uh, and to really communicate uh, among ourselves uh, in order to be able to create a transnational movement that will oppose these movements because they're extremely dangerous and I think um, we uh, have no choice but to stop them at this point in time. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, it's uh, Marta Paravi from Budapest. I'm the co-chair of the Hungarian Helsinki Committee, and it's a human rights non-governmental organization um, working not only in Hungary, but also in, in, in Europe. We work on refugee protection, criminal justice, and rule of law issues. Um, and I'll be talking about um, the far right in Hungary there's a lot of talk about far-right parties, um, extremist parties globally. Um, I will not focus on that, but rather I will be focusing on how the far-right ideology is being used as a political uh, tool in a very cynical and pragmatic way to drive Hungary further away from its core European democratic values into what is very often termed as an authoritarian, illiberal um, regime. This has not always been so. In the um, early 2010s, uh, after the general election that yielded Mr. Orban, the prime minister, his then second um, term of office, this was not a prevalent um, priority feature of, of uh, his politics, but it has become increasingly so. And now uh, it is, I think, quite right that most um, people discussing um, Prime Minister Orban will label him and the government that he leads as a far-right nationalist government when it comes to this, these terms. Um, it was probably in 2015 when such a marked change in the narrative that is used um, uh, was ha what happened and of course that was the year um, the January 2015 when Europe and also Hungary was confronted with a sudden arrival of migrants and asylum seekers at its border before that in Hungary, asylum refugee issues was a non-issue. It would never feature on the top pages of, or the front pages of newspapers. It was something that most people were completely ignorant about. Even you could say um, the experts, the journalists themselves really did not have too much information about it. 
So it was on, um, on a sort of a ground of ignorance that a very um, sophisticated and coordinated political messaging campaign could be built that targeted migrants and spoke about them as nothing but security risks. Now, this was a time when, of course, um, a lot of, of uh, people were coming to Hungary from Southern Europe, most of them um, by, by early summer 2015 were coming clearly from places around the world, mostly Syria, but not only where there was war, um, civil war, terror, trauma, so that they would have you certainly more than a, a good reason to seek asylum, seek protection in Europe. But nevertheless, the government's narrative only focused on, on the, the threats, the security threats um, of migration. And therefore, it was um, a very well-coordinated and very well-funded campaign that led Hungarians today to believe that migrants in general are a threat, not only in terms of security, but also as an identity threat. And this, the idea, the notion that migration is a threat, that refugees are not even mentioned as refugees, but rather only referred to as migrants, has become so prevalent that there is hardly anybody to contest this apart from some civil society groups. But on the political spectrum, it has become a toxic issue completely hijacked and dominated by Fidesz, Mr. Orban's party. And therefore, um, I think what is really striking uh, is how much silence there is instead of vocal um, counteraction. Now, after, you could say, four years of extremely intense um, government-driven uh, xenophobic hate campaigns against migrants, it seems that some uh, Hungarians have become tired of this. And in fact, there are very, very few asylum seekers and refugees in Hungary and the government rhetoric and also the sadly captured propaganda media has uh, always um, portrayed migrants as Muslims. So um, the, 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 the term itself has been absolutely twisted and since Hungarians don't meet that many Muslims in a, in a fairly white um, Hungary and they don't see refugees at all, it has become less of a convincing narrative. Not something that has stopped working, but certainly something that needs a little bit of rejuvenation. Um, and in recent uh, weeks, what we've seen is that um, after um, elections, local elections in October, which yielded some uh, results to the opposition parties and therefore Fidesz did uh, see some defeats. Uh, a few weeks um, ago in his um, be uh, first public address, Mr. Orban started talking not only of migrants, non-citizens, but Hungarian citizens, the Roma, as, um, as basically a group who are different, distinct from Hungarians. Roma in Hungary are Hungarian citizens. They, their native language is Hungarian. There is no doubt about their, to me, about their belonging to our community, but the Prime Minister spoke about this as a separate group, which is basically not worthy of, of the majority society's support, and instead it, it is a group of scroungers who are not working, um, but are um, uh, yeah, were, um, receiving payments without benefits. And this was triggered by a school desegregation um, action launched by a civil society organization. So anti-Roma sentiment seems to be uh, something that the Hungarian government uh, propaganda machinery is experimenting with, certainly. It is extremely alarming because it falls on um, on a population that is already very uh, united in anti-Romani sentiment. So unlike with migrants where Hungarians might have been um, quite uncertain but did not have very, um, uh, you know, decades or, 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 or centuries of built up um, anti-migrant sentiment, this in the case of Roma is certainly falling on a very, very fertile grounds. Um, studies have 
found um, that the Hungarian population is really um, basically united in a in a, a bias, prejudice, and even hatred of the of, of Hungarian Roma. And some studies say that there is no more obstacles. Um, that practically all social segments unite in uh, a perception that Roma are a separate alien ethnic group. Um, so this is something that I think is, is a really um, dangerous phenomenon. One thing that is also um, something that the Hungarian government and the prime minister himself is really using, and that's a transnationally inspired and, um, and driven a uh, new narrative in Hungary is a very strong focus on Christian identity and traditional family values. Now, this is where uh, Hungarian government, um, uh, senior government officials will attend conferences. The World Congress of Families, for example, is a prominent um, event where uh, uh, the Hungarian government has started attending. And also, this is the most uh, uh, the, the sort of the, the, the value-based uh, approach that seems to have been identified as something that the Hungarian government will be able to unite with across um, Europe with um, parties and, and politicians in France, in, in uh, Italy, the extreme right of Matteo Salvini and Marechal um, Le Pen. Um, but also in there's uh, quite a lot of allies in the US itself. I think this is uh, how we see something that is a global trend now playing out in a European member state. The most alarming thing about this is that it's the head of, uh, of a government in office that um, is exploiting these extremely alarming uh, sentiments. And not only are they racist, but they're used to um, to divert attention in Hungary away from um, rule of law dismantling. And the two things go together quite strongly. Thank you. Thank you, Marta. And thank you all for your excellent presentations. As you've heard, the far right has been uh, going from success to success. It has obviously been successful here in the United States, in the UK around Brexit, uh, in Hungary, and throughout Europe at the behest and leadership of Viktor Orban, uh, but through, as Walden said, through the global south as well. And it has been successful democratically uh, and through elections, very concerning development. But on one issue, the far right is extremely vulnerable. And this is something that came out of the interviews I conducted with 80 people around the world. And that is on environmental issues. Uh, the far right is, uh, has adopted one of, I would say, three positions. It has either uh, been silent on climate change and environmental questions more generally. Uh, in other words, it has taken a denial position that climate change basically is not happening, or if it is happening, it's not happening uh, at the hands of, of humans, but is a quote unquote natural phenomenon. Uh, and this has gone hand in hand with a number of uh, far right leaders, Donald Trump, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil, who are closely aligned with the interests of fossil fuel companies. Um, the second position would be basically a, a recognition of the importance of climate change. In other words, a recognition that a lot of people around the world acknowledge uh, the existence of climate change and therefore from a democratic point of view and point of view of trying to win elections, uh, the far right might have to address climate change issues. But this second position basically has put forth ridiculously inadequate solutions. And perhaps the most uh, egregious example of that would be Donald Trump saying, we're going to plant a bunch of trees. Uh, in other words, we'll keep the fossil fuel complex intact. And we'll continue to pump out uh, uh, carbon dioxide and, and other climate changing uh, effluents, but we'll plant some trees. Uh, and this is, uh, there was an article in the Washington Post uh, today about how the Republican Party is having a dawning recognition uh, that they're going to have to do say something about climate change and they're casting around for various uh, solutions and planting trees is, is uh, number one on that list. Uh, so you have 
denial, you have uh, ridiculously inadequate responses. And then the third, I would say, would be a kind of eco-fascist response in which some far-right organizations drawing on some history that goes all the way back to the Nazis and even before, uh, that the land is important, but the land is important only for the kind of majority populations within the borders of the country. And it doesn't really matter what happens elsewhere around the world, as long as the precious land uh, within the borders is preserved. Uh, and that it's necessary to build higher walls to keep out uh, the migrants, including an increasing number of migrants coming from uh, the global south as a result of climate change, uh, and that these walls are uh, even worse than an inadequate response to climate change, uh, but actually a deleterious one. And so the flip side, of course, is the response. This is an opportunity for progressives, and uh, Andreas talked about that aspect of the report, not only outlines kind of uh, the rise of the global right and its transnational connections, but also how uh, the progressive and liberal movements can work together in response uh, to the far right. And here is an opportunity on the climate change issue uh, for progressives to work transnationally uh, in coordination. And perhaps the most prominent uh, example of that is the Green New Deal, which has been put forward uh, within particular countries, but also at a global level. And the Green New Deal basically addresses two concerns. One, of course, is climate change, uh, reducing carbon emissions as dramatically as possible in a short period of time, but also addresses some of the economic concerns that have been, um, shall we say, the, one of the key bases of the far right support in, in elections. And that is a concern about jobs and a concern about prosperity. And the Green New Deal says, well, we're not only going to address climate change questions by reducing carbon emissions, but we're going to have a kind of uh, almost an Apollo mission type uh, project to uh, rebuild infrastructure, to retrofit buildings, to create jobs as part of a new sustainable economy. Um, and uh, I would say finally that uh, the Democrats in the United States are generally speaking addressing questions of climate change, but they haven't really gone fully on board with the Green New Deal, with the exception perhaps of Bernie Sanders. Um, I would hesitate to, to advise them to come up with a very detailed plan for the Green New Deal. That's one of the defects so far is that it hasn't been um, detailed uh, particularly here in the United States or in any other country, but we've seen uh, that that's a pitfall for Democratic candidates coming out with two detailed responses. For instance, Elizabeth Warren's health care plan. If you provide too detailed a response at this point, uh, you kind of open yourself up to criticism and uh, impossible objections. So the Green New Deal, at least from an electoral point of view, uh, should probably remain aspirational in combining the environmental and economic concerns. And I'll end there. Thank you, John. And thank you all um, for presenting. Um, now we're going to move to a question and answer session. And I'd be curious to know if any of you who've joined the call um, have any question that you that you um, thought of throughout the call. Um, and I'll just go ahead and start. And if and following this, if anyone else wants to jump in, uh, please do. So one of the questions is, um, it might be directed toward uh, Walden. So we usually understand the far right as taking advantage of popular anger at elites. Uh, yet, Duterte seems to be waging war on the poorest segments of Philippine society. Similar things could be said of India's treatment of Muslims, Europe's treatment of Arabs and Africans, and the U.S. treatment of Central American refugees. It seems like these politics actually require a middle-class base of anger toward the poorer classes. Uh, can left populism designed to lift up the working class really diffuse this middle-class anger? Well, I think uh, the uh, the uh, uh, person who asked the question definitely has her finger or his finger on a very important thing, uh, which is you know that uh, uh, it is uh, middle class people reflecting a lot of the anxieties of the middle class, 
uh, you know, that provide uh, what I call the active consensus uh, behind a number of these leaders and a number of these movements, uh, whether it's in India or the Philippines. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I, I, I would say, though, that there is, uh, you know, that that other classes, um, uh, you know, the poorer classes, um, in many ways, also get swept up in it. I think, though, that what they have is a more passive kind of consensus, which to use Gramsci, um, as opposed to the active consensus of of the middle class. So, I I think it is extremely important to see the middle class as not just being manipulated by um, these um, charismatic figures, but that it does play an active role uh, in terms of pushing this, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, the, this policies and these people, uh, you know, uh, you know, forward. So, um, uh, so I think we we need to look at classes. Uh, in a much more um, uh, careful way, and uh, see how uh, they are not their participants uh, in you know creating this sort of right wing um, um, you know uh, movements and consensus. So I I would say therefore that um, for progressives I think we come back to the question that. John and others have posed, which is, you know, that um, we really need to offer, um, you know, a much more attractive vision uh, of democracy. Uh, you know, we need to offer, uh, uh, you know, the, you know, the sense that uh, uh, we have to move forward to real equality when it comes to economic power and the reduction of inequality. Uh, and, you know, that, uh, you know, that this democracy and, 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 and uh, the reduction of inequality, whether we call it socialism or by any other term, uh, I think that, uh, you know, that is something that should be very essential in our, in, 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 in our uh, counter to this uh, movements, uh, but not only, you know, we need to also bring in, you know, combating, you know, the different uh, sources of injustice, whether it's climate or gender. Uh, so, um, so I, I would say I would leave my answer there for the time being. Thank you. And did anyone else on the call uh, want to chime in with the question, comment? Uh, if not, I have I have something else to follow up with. So uh, I think there's curiosity about like the mechanism that enabled the far right to proliferate. And uh, what I take from that is, are we talking about these these groups are you know they have boots on the ground organizing are they using some sort of digital tool apps the internet what is it that allowed these groups to proliferate as quickly as they did and uh, just and from from an anecdote here just in my lifetime I've we've gone from seeing these comments these uh these type of movements and this type of language this xenophobia from it being very fringe to you know within the span of ten. 10 years or so being acceptable. And in, in many cases around the world, people working in government um, holding these sentiments. So what's the mechanism that really allowed that movement to take off? Well, I can speak to that to some extent. Um, I just, I think that there's no way to excuse social media and the web for allowing a, a couple things. One, the activities of anonymity online, the ability to express sentiments that were considered in, you know, improper, not polite dinner conversation in a way um, that you couldn't do in the real world. And the web has allowed uh, far right propaganda, extremist ideas to proliferate like crazy, fake news. I mean, there's just a lot 
of terrible things, including algorithms that drive people from one extremist idea to a, another. Um, my understanding too is that use of this technology has allowed the creation quickly of political parties and other formations, whether it might be you know Trump on Twitter or the AFD in Germany using um, online mechanisms to build up their forces that then work in tandem with real world activities, right? You can launch campaigns online that lead to people in the streets and these things work together. And, you know, there have been examples like the Arab Spring where initially this was looked to be something positive, but it also has, has a major downside to it. Um, I don't know as much about how that functions in the global South, but that is certainly a serious problem, hate speech, Right, um, extremist organizing, even planning domestic terrorist attacks and the like that are happening in the online space. And, you know, it's another area where there has to be an affirmative response to what that world should look like to be able to build on progressive politics. I'd be interested to hear um, from Walden or Marta how they view that in, in other countries or John, you know, the folks that you spoke to about how this dynamic works out. I don't think we'd have the white supremacist movement we have in the United States if we didn't have the tandem of online radicalization accompanied by figures like Donald Trump mainstreaming ideas that used to be unacceptable. Well, uh, just just to take a stab at that, uh, Heidi, I definitely um, the troll as of Modi and Duterte are extremely well organized. Uh, and uh, just as in the many other parts of the world, they were able to organize uh, much more rapidly uh, than uh, other political parties. I mean, it's if you look at in India, for instance, the, you know, the millions that, you know, have, um, you know, been brought into the Modi camp via, you know, the, you know, the, you know, the, the internet, uh, you know, the, what Congress, the opposition party has been able to do has been quite pitiful, you know, so they, they, you know, there were these parties that used traditional mechanisms, traditional patronage mechanisms, suddenly they were just completely outmaneuvered. Um, Having said that, I, I would say though that um, that it is important not to attribute the dynamism of these movements to their ability to have um, you know this um, you know uh, system of sophisticated trolling. You know? Uh, I think that there were very real, real anxieties and concerns that were swirling out there, okay? You know, that uh, these politicians, you know, uh, were able to harness and, um, uh, and um, intensify. And um, so, so it's a combination of things. I think it's, it's, it's the crisis of brought about by globalization it's the crisis that's brought about by the failure or perceived failure of liberal democracy not to deliver. It's the, some of these charismatic figures being able to you know, whip up and draw out some of these hate sentiments. Uh, and then reinforced by these uh, mechanisms of the net, uh, which have been harnessed by the parties associated with these people. So it's a combination of different factors. Uh, 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 but I would say uh, we cannot say that it is the kind of internet trolling, you know, that has been the, the principal factor in terms of being able to create this, uh, this, this movement. So that is, that is really my sense about the ways that different factors have combined to create this 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 movements. I, I would add that um, I, I would agree with Heidi that the internet and social media has definitely opened up pathways for the far right and the extreme right, um, but that for the the larger bulk of people who are 
uh, supporting people like um, Bolsonaro or Trump or some of the the, the quote-unquote more mainstream far right like uh, like Orban in Hungary, it's more along the lines of what what Walden is saying that globalization promised a great amount, great uh, great paradise, if you will, coming after the uh, end of the Cold War. A backlash was almost inevitable because uh, globalization was not going to deliver on everything that it promised. Uh, and the question was, where was that backlash going to come from? Yeah. Uh, it could have come from the left, but the left in large, sent, uh, large part been discredited uh, after the end of the Cold War by its association with uh, communism or, or failed projects of socialism, so to speak. So it opened up this enormous opportunity on the right. And Marta, I'm sure, can, can speak to this, but the, the figure of Viktor Orban is, is exemplary in this regard because, of course, he was, you know, a leader of a liberal party. Fidesz was a liberal party yeah. in, in the, the late 1980s and early 1990s. And it would have probably stayed that way if globalization had produced what it had promised uh, for Hungary and for other countries. But it didn't, and Orban saw an enormous political opportunity on the right, and he switched all the way over to that side of the spectrum in order to take advantage of it. And he wasn't the only one to do so. Uh, so I, I would I would combine both of Walden and Heidi's uh, perspectives there. Uh, we have just about eight to ten minutes left, and I I wanted to give another uh, opportunity for anyone who's uh, on via a phone to chime in if there's any questions or comments. If not, we have a, another question. Oh, we have one coming in. Go ahead, Evian. Thanks. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Great. Um, I guess to introduce myself, my name is Avion Leidig, and I'm based at the Center for Research on Extremism in Oslo. Um, I mean, a lot of my research is looking at uh, how the far right mobilizes online, transnationally. And when it comes to countering the far right, um, you know, there's obviously an issue in terms of how social media companies can effectively counter or uh, take steps such as censoring or banning users from its platforms. Um, but something that I have noticed to be somewhat successful are creative responses towards countering the far right, uh, whether that be from left-wing individuals who reveal the sort of satire and um, sort of hypocrisy of far right narratives. Uh, so I was wondering if anybody on the panel could discuss if they've seen any effective um, counter strategies against the far right, um, uh, whether that be at the grassroots level or the policy level, I'm quite interested as, a, as an academic in terms of uh, positive responses in this area. Thanks. I'll, I'll throw one out there that I thought was particularly uh, clever. Uh, to counter a, a, a far-right march in Germany, the, the counter-protesters, instead of just getting out there with signs uh, saying, you know, we don't like you <laughs> and your, your ideas are lousy, they actually came up with a walkathon uh, idea so that uh, everyone was pledging from the outside. The longer the far-right marched, the more they raised for progressive causes, the causes they were, they were against. And it put the far right marchers in a quandary. Do they stop, in which case they have kind of given in to the protesters, or do they continue walking and continue raising money for the causes that they hate the most? So I thought that was a particularly clever way of, of inverting the, the, the far right strategy. Uh, yes, I, I, I know this too, and I, I think it's, it's a very, um, good way to to you know do the fundraising and also the awareness raising uh humor is certainly important but another thing i think that certainly human rights groups themselves are confronted with it's not only about extremism and and hate that they're they have their work cut out but also about the whole human rights narrative coming under a lot of pressure 
partly from from um, from far right pol politicians and and political leaders. So uh, there is a lot of work done around uh, new narratives and what works, and it's very. Um, uh, interesting to see uh, that a good part of that work, and we're also experimenting with this in Hungary, tells the, the human rights community, and I think you can probably adapt this message to other groups too, that it's important not only to be very vocal about what you're against, but also to clearly show what is it that you're about and what kind of vision you have for people who feel that they're alienated um, by by the, the 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 messages that they have been growing tired of, I think a lot of people, um, uh, certainly also in Hungary, but around the world here, human rights is not being for them, but it's about exactly those others that they don't want to be associated with, that they are told to hate, that they are they're they're um, that they're angry about, and to show in a in a in a genuinely convincing way that um that it's it's something that is for everybody uh that it's an inclusive idea it's a positive idea and it will um and through this sort of it's often called hope-based communication but by by showcasing what benefit um the 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 sort of yeah the other other direction gives them, then it's an appealing not only to the rational, but also the emotional um, side of our human psyches, that we're, we're far better off. And I think there's a, in the past few years, I've seen really good, not only studies and guides, but also experiments with, with this kind of communication that has um, been able to, to negate the 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 very vile aggressive messaging on human rights um, and i'm pretty sure that would be something where we can also learn from each other when it comes to anti-racism and anti-hate um, work well uh, yes let me just add you know that uh, when you look at the far right in uh, many countries um, uh, they are still uh, a minority, uh, and uh, it is important to you know not only keep them in minority, but to, you know to make them even less uh, of a political force, uh, so that a great deal uh, you know then becomes centered on the politics of how you do that, uh, which includes electoral strategies, uh, for instance. Uh, and, um, you know, working uh, in order to be able to win over, uh, you know, certain uh, groups. And I, you know, I, again, uh, if, if we look at uh, uh, the United States, uh, uh, which, uh, um, and what led to Trump's um, election, in 2016, despite his losing the popular votes. And um, uh, the Democrats have had four years to figure out how do you win back Wisconsin? How do you win back Ohio? How do you win back uh, Michigan? And how do you win back Pennsylvania? And you know, where there was, you know, this 80,000 votes of mainly the white working class that swung to Trump and determined the elections. So I guess what I'm saying here is, you know, that um, in many ways, it's going to be on the ground kind of political electoral strategies, you know, that um, uh, uh, are going to be very critical uh, in terms of um, diffusing uh, and uh, piercing the right wing uh, bubble. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully uh, there will be, uh, given the fact that in the United States at this point in time, the red and blue state 
divide seems to be fairly stable except for this rust belt states, uh, uh, hopefully, um, uh, and as somebody that's affected by US electoral politics because the, whoever is the president of the United States, uh, it affects all of us here. I really hope that there is going to be a really effective way of addressing what I have just raised about the um, dominance of the, uh, you know, of the critical character of this states uh, that is going to come up again uh, in this uh, November. So I would say that um, on the ground electoral strategies, on the ground thinking, on the ground moving, uh, uh, there's no substitute for that. Uh, you know, in terms of being able to 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 be able to reverse the right wing uh, tide. Thank you all. Uh, it looks like we're just about out of time. I did want to remind everyone that I will send this recording around, and I will include um, a link to the report that was the basis for this discussion. And if there are any other materials that you, the presenters, would like me to include, um, please forward that to me and I will make sure to send that out as well. And I want to thank you all for joining us.